All right, everybody, welcome to the Strategic Acquisition Workshop, our four-day live virtual workshop. We will be doing this from 11 a.m. to plus or minus 1 p.m. My guess is we'll go over each day. If you know me, I tend to go over. It is what it is because I like to uh, under-promise and over-deliver. Um, and I get in the weeds on a lot of things, which is good because nobody out there will take you into the weeds and we have to get into the weeds if we actually want to understand what to do. Um, you will see as I go through the agenda that this one is going to be a little bit more high level uh, than I normally do. We are going to go into the weeds in a few things, but there just isn't enough time, even if we did this four-day workshop all month, to cover absolutely everything that we're going to cut that I would like to cover for knowing how to do multifamily from start to finish. So we're going to give an overview uh, and then there'll be opportunities for you to continue this um, in other ways. So let's talk about the agenda. If I can get my PowerPoint working, we'll be in business. There we go. So what are we going to cover in this workshop? So this is the agenda for the next four days. So day one today, we're going to talk about acquisitions. Uh, we're going to start and register your real estate investing holding company. I see a whole lot of posts even today. I, I don't understand it. A quick Google search would tell you what to do, but I see people all the time. How should I register my entity? Do I need an LLC? Do I need a corporation? Do I need this? Do I, do I need a trust? Do I, does it need to be, look, don't overthink it. Okay. I've been in this business over 12 years and my LLC is right here in the state of Alabama. If we purchased a property outside the state, we purchased it with that state's uh, secretary of state and then filed our entity as a foreign registry so that we can manage that LLC. It's not difficult. So I want to go over because we got to start with the begin. We got to begin with the end in mind. The best thing to do is just go ahead and knock that out. It doesn't cost hardly anything, a lot less than you might think to get your LLC registered. Then we'll talk about how to find off-market opportunities, which are a really big deal today, especially as we enter 2024 and uh, all the opportunities start to pop up uh, with all the foreclosures that are going to occur this year. Then I'll go into the six creative acquisition methods show you the actual legal structure for doing a subject to, uh, not this crap that they teach in these Facebook groups and people that want to make money from you and everything else. I'm going to give you the actual legal structure on how to do it legally uh, and along with five other uh, methods. And then we'll talk about action steps and do a Q&A at the end of today. Day two, we're going to talk about analysis. So we're going to start with a strategic analysis model. So for those that know me, know I'm a CI-102 instructor for the CCIM Institute. Inside CI-102, we teach the strategic analysis model, which is due diligence. And once we get through it, you'll understand. We'll talk about hiring a property management company and then getting the money, the entire capital stack from your passive investors, if you're doing a syndication, uh, or trying to get a loan from a lender. And then we'll cover action steps and a Q&A at the end of day two. Day three, we're going to cover operations. So day one, acquisitions. We're acquiring a property. Day two is an uh, analysis. We have to determine whether the property meets our acquisition criteria or not, that due diligence and everything involved in it in order to close the deal. Day three, how do we operate this sucker once we get it? This is where most people stop. So all these gurus out there that are teaching you tactics, they'll give you some stuff for acquisitions. They'll give you some stuff for due diligence, but not enough for you to be able to go out and do it on your own. But they never talk about what to do once you purchase the asset. There are one or two courses on some minor asset management stuff, but that's it. You do find some information like David Lindahl's got a book out called Multifamily Millions. It came out in 2008. Probably the best book I've ever read on uh, value add, how to reposition an apartment complex. 
I don't think anybody's ever written a book better than what David wrote. Uh, so to this day, I still recommend that book. So those that weren't paying attention, Multifamily Millions, David Lindahl. Yes, I just recommended a guru. I'm not telling you to go purchase his courses or anything else. Just read the book. It's a great book. It was one of the, I think the second book I ever read on multifamily investing. To this day, I still recommend it. So for operations, obviously, we're going to talk about asset management. Then we're going to talk about the property business plan. How do you actually write the business plan? Thank you, Richard. And then we'll get into project management because in order for you to be able to do a value add, you have to know how to manage the project. Even if you hire a project manager to do it or a general contractor, you need to know how to hire that project manager or that general contractor. So we're going to talk about all of that. And then we'll talk about exiting the deal, right? Do some action steps and then have a final Q&A for day one through three. Okay, so for those of you that paid for day four, so the free version of this is day one through three. If you paid for VIP, we have an extra day on Thursday, which is VIP day. We're gonna do some accountability and group coaching. Make sure that you're doing those action steps that we talk about in each one of the <clears throat> days at the end of the session. We're gonna go over next steps and then have a wrap up and final Q&A on day four. All right, so that is the agenda. So what am I wrapping <clears throat> this whole course around? Well, I've created a system called the Strategic Acquisition System. There are three phases to the Strategic Acquisition System, and I can see I kind of screwed up um, down here, but that's all right. We'll fix it later. Each phase has steps. Notice that day one is acquisitions, day two is analysis, day three is operations. Okay, there's a method to my madness. Beginning with the end, having that clearly defined real estate entity. Finding opportunities, having an automated lead generation conversion system built and ready to go. So as we're talking about uh, finding off-market opportunities and building relationships with influencers, there is a way to automate that process. A lot of you know, especially if you got the VIP, you got 30 days free access to Acquisition Pro. So we're going to show you how to utilize software to automate your systems. Negotiations, this is where we get into those six alternative acquisition strategies so that you can negotiate uh, a win-win result. Get into phase two analysis, there's due diligence. We covered that uh, on day two, how to hire a property management company, and then of course the capital stack, getting that money. Day three for operations, asset management, project management, and exiting the deal. So there is a method to my madness. This is a system that I have created and it absolutely stinking works, okay? Again, we're gonna kind of stay, we're gonna go into the weeds in step one. We're gonna kind of stay a little high level, but we're gonna go into the weeds in automation on step two. Uh, we're gonna go into the weeds a little bit into negotiation, definitely going into the weeds in due diligence and property management going to stay a little high level on capital stack, go into the weeds on asset and project management and exiting the deal, All right? So a little mix of going into the weeds and high level. What you don't see here, and everybody's probably already thinking it, well, how the heck do I underwrite this thing? Great question. I have courses on YouTube and it all over the place that teach underwriting. Could not fit underwriting into this course because even when I do my most basic version of underwriting, it's still a three or four hour session. So didn't have time to fit it in this, but there are plenty of opportunities for you, uh, either free or paid to see all my underwriting stuff. All right. So who am I? For those that don't know me, I am David Monroe. I'm a CCIM. For those that don't know what CCIM is, you can go to CCIM.com to research it. We are certified commercial investment members. There's over 13,000 in the United States and around the world. Uh, and I am a uh, CCIM instructor 
I teach advanced market analysis and there's only 60 instructors for that 13,000 membership. Uh, one of the things that we like to say at CCIM is that we are the MBA of commercial real estate. What do we mean by that? Well, our course curriculum is actually uh, written into 135 universities in the United States for their real estate MBA programs. They literally use our curriculum. So when we say we are the MBA of commercial real estate, we mean it. I'm a multifamily investor and strategic consultant. I am on the CCIM technology board as vice president for 2024. I'm the education committee vice chair for CCIM this year, which means I have to be the chair next year. I am the Ward Center past chair. Ward Center is another education arm of CCIM. I'm the founder of Acquisition Pro and the Strategic Acquisition System. I'm a former syndicator, now passive investor. And at one time, I did own a property management company. Okay. So here's what I want to do because we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to create breakout rooms. Let's see how many folks do we have here? We've got uh, about 50 people. So I'm going to create 10 breakout rooms. I'm going to put you guys into breakout rooms, five people a piece. So there's 51 of you. So one room will get uh, six. What I want you to do is just introduce yourselves to each other. This is the best way to do some quick networking and get yourself introduced. One thing I would recommend and what I like to use as an icebreaker is Give yourself um, about a, about 90 seconds each. That gives you a little bit of time for some banter at the end before I bring you back. And tell something that nobody knows about you, okay? For me, something uh, you may not know about me is when I was in the Marine Corps, I had a run-in, an argument basically with the former vice president of the United States, at the time he was the secretary of defense, Dick Cheney. I actually had um, a pilot in the front seat. He was our CEO that knew Mr. Cheney. And um, he uh, was able to get Mr. Cheney to finally uh, do what we needed him to do before we could take off. So I like to say that I have uh, won an argument against the former vice president of the United States. Not A, a lot of people can say that. But then we ended up becoming best friends. It was the weirdest thing in the world. I had to deal with him for about 10 months in the Philippines uh, during the first Gulf War, the first Bush War, when he was just Secretary of Defense. So that's something a lot of people don't know about me. So I'm going to throw out some breakout rooms here. Uh, I'm going to create 10 of them. I'm going to assign automatically and create. And I will see you guys. So it is 1016. I'm going to bring you back at 1025. So nine minutes. We'll see you guys in uh, nine minutes. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from our introductions and networking. Hopefully that was good. One of the difficult things about doing a virtual workshop is being able to get everybody together and actually hold conversations and exchange contact information, stuff like that. So one of the things that I actually welcome in uh, our workshop sessions and masterclasses that I do is absolutely feel free to put your contact information into the chat so everybody has it, as well as a value proposition if you want to do that. The only thing I don't ask uh, or that I ask you not to do 
is to put any information about a specific deal you're working on, um, then we start to get a little shady about violating certain um, rules regarding how we market to people. So just refrain from that. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, Angela says, Rich Mioli. Angela, can you just send him the link? It's the same link for everybody. Uh, he may have registered back in November and didn't get the new registration link, even though I sent all those emails out. That would really help because I, I don't have the ability to do that right now. Uh, all right. So everybody's starting to do that. Outstanding. So what I'm going to do is for those that are uh, wanting to spend time with us on day four, there's the link to get access to day four when you have an opportunity. Just save the link. Don't go there now because we're about ready to get into some good teaching. The other thing is, as I'm going through, uh, yes, I am recording this, but I love interaction from the uh, audience. Uh, hold on. Uh, no, Michael, I don't do that. Uh, this is an ongoing chat, so you guys should be able to download the chat when you're done. And I can send the chat notes. That's no big deal either. Um, I love interaction. So I may stop and ask you a question. It is a not asking anybody specifically, just for you to um, respond. And I'll sit there and wait until somebody responds because that's what I do. I want to know you guys are with me, that you're not sleeping, that this is educational or even entertaining. Uh, I like to be at least a little bit entertaining or I lose you and you go away because two hours is a long time to sit and listen to me just Wayne and babble. Isn't that right, Wayne? <laughs> Wayne's used to just sitting around and hearing me babble. So um, please be interactive with me. If I'm moving too fast or you have a question and the question is urgent, please stop me and I will um, stop and answer that question. I will be monitoring the chat. I could see Garth just put his email address in there. So I am monitoring the chat. So I'll see that. Um, but if you like raise your hand or something like that, that I'm not going to see. So if you have a pressing question, please stop and uh, stop me and I'll, I'll answer the question. If it's not pressing and it can wait to the end, we will have a Q&A at the end. All right. So you guys have any questions about the agenda before we get moving. All righty. So let's see if we can cur curtail this to an hour and a half of education. <laughs> We're going to be hard pressed to do it, but let's see what we can do. All right. Strategic Acquisition Workshop, day one, acquisitions. So you're familiar with this. We already showed you in the agenda. We are right here in phase one. Uh, as we go through the agenda again for day one, you'll see that we are doing beginning with the end, finding opportunities and negotiations, which become our teaching points for this lesson. So we're going to cover introductions to systems, determine your number. So part of also uh, creating your LLC or your entity is setting your goals. Well, you can't set goals until you know what your monthly number is that you need to get every month in order to live the lifestyle you want to live or to be able to quit your W-2 if you still have a W-2. Uh, very few people have seen this. I do have a video, two videos posted on YouTube about how to determine your number, but we are going to talk about that in detail here. Then we'll determine your company name, uh, lease some space on the internet and get you a company email. And I'm gonna explain why that is going to be especially important nine days from today, actually 10 days from today. Um, oh, you know what? Today is my son's 21st birthday and I have not wished him a happy birthday. He is not watching this. So <laughs> uh, happy birthday, Dylan, even though I know you're not watching this, I'll tell you happy birthday here shortly. Completely forgot my son's birthday. Uh, how to find off-market opportunities using automation. Um, we'll kind of go a little high level with that and spend some time uh, on PowerPoint as well as going into Acquisition Pro very briefly. And then the six creative acquisition uh, methods. 
Then we'll talk about action steps and finish with Q&A. So introduction to systems. So this is a definition that I found online for systems. First time small business owners have a success rate of 18%. Business owners who failed in the past have a slightly higher startup process uh, or have a higher, slightly higher startup success rate of 20%. So if you've tried to start a business before and you failed and this is your second time, you got about 2% better chance than you had before. Business owners who started a successful startup in the past have a business success rate of around 30% when starting a new venture. So even if you were successful on your first business venture or third or fourth or fifth, you still only have a 30% chance of succeeding another time. So we end up frustrated when we start a business because we're doomed for failure. The numbers tell us we are doomed for failure. Well, most recently, Franit, which is a uh, data analytic company, looked at 1,500 businesses that were franchised between 2006 and 2010, and were able to provide some insight into franchise success rates. Out of them, about 92% were still open after two years and 85% were in operations after five. In contrast, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that about only 80% of independent businesses stay open after two years. Okay, so now we're starting to look at systems because what do franchises give you when you purchase a franchise or supposedly supposed to give you. Now, I've got one person that registered. I'm not sure if he's on here or not. Uh, he's with a company called Sperry Commercial Global Affiliates. I used to be a Sperry Commercial Global Affiliate member, and it is a franchise model. I purchased that franchise, but for whatever reason, they never provided a business system. So, those uh, those individuals that purchase those franchises, it's a commercial brokerage franchise, they are destined to failure day one. The Sperry Care, nope, they just want their franchise fee and their, their monthly marketing fees. That's what these franchises are designed to do. But with systems, we extremely increase our, or exponentially increase our rate of success. All right, so what do franchises have in common? Well, it is systems. Without a system, you have an 85% chance of failure. Systems don't have to be tech, but why not? So the strategic acquisition system was created and I've implemented it into Acquisition Pro. Now, we'll talk about that later, okay? So first, I wanna talk about determining your number. So we're in step one, begin with the end, okay, begin at the end. So we gotta determine your number. How do you know how much money you need to make in order to either live the lifestyle you want to live if you're already an entrepreneur, or how do you know what that number needs to be in order to quit your W-2 to start becoming a full-time entrepreneur? So that's what we're going to talk about. There's an, it's not really an acronym, they're just uh, six, letters to represent the different buckets for how we think about money. As an entrepreneur, 100% of all your revenue goes in this bucket. And you can equate these to um, bank accounts if you want to. I combine these into three bank accounts for myself. But all revenue, 100% of entrepreneurial activity, not W-2 income, entrepreneurial activity, 100% goes into the revenue bucket. About 30% depends on where you live. If you live in California or New York City, uh, you may have to increase this a little bit based on the state you live in. For most of the country, for about 95% of us, we need to be putting about 30% of everything we make into a tax bucket. Hold on one second here. I've got uh, somebody, there we go, that is taken care of. Okay. Next, we have 
our personal bucket. So these are all of our personal expenses, what it takes for us to live. And we're going to cover personal here very, very shortly, which really leads us to where that monthly number needs to come from. Next, we have investment. Investment at 10% may be a little low for you, but if you raise investment, you've got to lower something else because all of these are going to equal 100%. So revenue, 100%, the other five are what we're taking from that revenue. Next is charity. Charity is your philanthropic, uh, philanthropic uh, opportunities where you can give back, all right? So whether that's tithing at your church, whether it's given to um, any of these children's hospitals or veterans administrations or any other organization that you like to give to, charitable donations uh, should be a part of your buckets. And the last is operations. So you should be able to operate your company. So operations is the expenses for operating this 100%. Now for me, my bank accounts, my revenue, and operations all come out of one bucket. I don't separate these. Taxes and investment and charity are one bucket and personal is one bucket. So I have three bank accounts. I've got revenue, which includes operations. I've got my personal and then taxes, investment, and charity all go into a separate account, okay? So that's how I do mine. Now, what does this tell us about how to get to our number? Well, determine your monthly number this way. First, write down everything you want, okay? In order to live the lifestyle you desire or everything you're currently paying as a W-2 employee. We need to know this number, all right? So you've got to put a number on it. Think about your mortgage, okay? If you're, or your rent, if you're currently renting or you have a mortgage and you're trying to leave your W-2 and start working, what, what is that number? All right. So you need to be able to satisfy that expense, your utilities, your um, clothing that you buy, entertainment, restaurant, food, cars, insurance, everything you can think of that you spend money on uh, in a monthly period, that's what needs to go here. Now, for those that want to find out what their lifestyle number is, you have to do some forward looking. You've got to do some forward thinking. And now we're pro forma. We're going to create a pro forma on what that number is going to be. So for me, based on that, that, uh, forever home for me and my family, we'd like to have about 3,500 to 4,000 square feet. We're in 3,200 now. We'd like to have just a little bit more, but there's some other things I need. I need a big shop because I'm a car guy. I don't have a big shop right now. So I need a big shop. I need some land, maybe 10 to 12 acres because the wife wants horses and some other things, right? So I have to determine what is that mortgage going to be uh, when I believe I can reach that number. And for me, it came out to about $8,500. So that is my PITI, more uh, principal interest, taxes, and insurance uh, for the home that I believe. And I chose the state and used what I thought the interest rate would be, which I put, I think I put 7%, 7 or 8%, because I believe interest rates are going to stay up. They aren't going to go down. We're, we're at the long-term average right now, but that's another discussion for later. Same with utilities. What do you think your utilities are going to be based on that size of a home in the market you want to move to? Uh, what cars do you want? We're hot rodders. So we've got a hot rod. We're, my wife's going to want a luxury SUV. She's got one, but it's a little older. She'd like a new one. Uh, I want my uh, big truck because I like a big diesel truck. Um and uh, then we want an RV. So I had to determine whether you think you could pay cash or not, put a monthly number to those as if you were financing them. 
So it will help you uh, get to that number and whatever's excess, just throw it in investment and charity. All right. So determine what all that's going to be. Insurance, everything. Put a number on it, write it down. All right. That becomes the monthly number that you need in order to cover your lifestyle. All right. Add all those expenses to determine that lifestyle expense. Divide your monthly total by your personal bucket. So if you keep your personal bucket at 20%, then you're going to divide what that number is by 0.2, all right? For me, that number, and I don't remember the exact, I know my monthly total, I don't remember uh, what my actual number was. I got it written down somewhere. Uh, oh, it's right here. Uh, was my monthly total was 27,700. So in order to live the lifestyle I want to live, it's going to cost me $27,700 a month just in my lifestyle expenses. So now I divide that point by 0.2 and that tells me that I need to make $138,500 a month. That is my number, okay? For me, that's my number. Then you go back and you start throwing everything else in the rest of the buckets. So that becomes the revenue needed for your lifestyle. And then I multiply the remaining buckets by their percentage. Again, if you're just trying to figure out how to determine what you need to leave your W-2 to become an entrepreneur, do this exact same thing only with your current monthly expenses. It's going to be much lower than 138000 but it's also going to be higher than what you think it's going to be. Okay. Was this helpful? Need some feedback here. Yes. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So I kind of missed the uh, the two. You know, dividing it by two percent. What is the divided by point two? Point two. 20, okay. You're dividing by twenty percent. Okay. And the purpose of that, please. Uh, that takes you. That gives you the amount of your personal bucket. Got okay. It. That's also the number you need in order to live that lifestyle or to quit that W two. So 100% of your entrepreneurial money uh, goes into the revenue bucket and you should be living on 20% of that. Thank you. Yep. Now, if you have a side hustle uh, and you have a part-time job while you're an entrepreneur, that's okay. Your W-2 income gets added to your personal bucket. So you get to subtract from the expenses based on that W-2 income for the time being. Remember that you're eventually going to leave that as well. So you really want to just make it what your expenses are. But if you want to throw your W-2 income in, it does go in the personal bucket and you subtract it from your expenses. All right. How to determine your company name, web domain, and email. Now, you guys at this point have the number you need to set your goals. I've done plenty of classes on how to set goals. Um, there are uh, videos on my YouTube channel about how to set goals. The biggest thing is creating action steps, but I can almost promise you that you did not know what your number was. You may have guessed what it's going to be. I saw some people put in the chat notes that uh, determine the number of units we need to own. Um, I would go away from that because you're going to find that market conditions change and um, that may not be something you can continue to set goals from because you don't have control of it. So you should be setting goals on things you do have control of. So you need to identify action steps that it's going to take to reach that monthly number. But now you have a target. All right, that was the key to this. Now you have a three to five to 10 year target that you can work from. All right, that was the point of that. Next, we're gonna determine your company name, web domain, uh, and email, leasing that internet space to make it real estate related. First, you want to make it sellable. So Richard's got uh, the last text in the chat notes. So you probably don't want Richard Hall, LLC. Nobody's going to buy that from you when it comes time for you to exit, okay? Uh, and what I mean by exit is sell the company 
in the future for a nice payday so you can go relax, all right? Um, you want to make it sellable, right? Like Acquisition Pro. Initially, I had it called the uh, Strategic CRM. For whatever reason, I really didn't like that. There's a lot of things. It's more than a CRM. It's much more than a CRM. And Acquisition Pro is just about as sellable as they come. If you think about acquisitions, it doesn't have to be real estate related. So the tool as well as the system can be uh, used for selling anything. Now, obviously the strategic acquisition system I showed you was real estate related, but the way Acquisition Pro is built, it is a lead conversion tool. So once the lead hits the tool, we take them through an automated process and a pipeline where you are acquiring either an opportunity or an investor as a real estate person. For me, I'm either acquiring an acquisition pro client, a strategic acquisition certification client, uh, or selling anything. If I wanted to sell cars, I could use acquisition pro to sell cars. If I wanted to sell medical devices or copy machines, it doesn't matter. So when I created that name, I identified one sellable piece of real estate online. Okay, so that's the key. We want to make your name sellable. Now we got to do a little research. First, you want to see, is there a domain name available? And it doesn't have to be GoDaddy. It can be Namecheap or any of the other um, uh, domain providers. I just use GoDaddy, so I put it here been using GoDaddy for over 20 years. Okay, make sure it's a .com, but don't buy it yet. Right now we're still researching. So I've thought, okay, well, I, I like this name. Let's go see if it has a .com. And you can even start uh, brainstorming names while checking to see if the .com is available. Once you find a match you like, okay, now we need to go research that name for trademark and copyright. Um. One of the first names I settled with, and I didn't go check it for trademark and copyright, was REI Pro. And I went ahead and bought the domain and started to build it out. And then I went to go register it for the trademark and found out it was already a, a trademark. I was like, ah, okay. So that's why I'm telling you, do not purchase the domain yet. All right, go research it. You can just, it's USPTO.gov. Uh, for trademark. Uh, I don't remember what it is for copyright. You can just search in Google um, trademark name or search trademark, search copyright, and the links will come up for you to search that name for trademarks and copyright. But you're not done with your research yet. Now you need to go search the Secretary of State for the website. Here's the thing. You're going to hear a lot of people tell you, oh, you need a Wyoming or you need a Nevada or you need a Delaware LLC because of anonymity, blah, 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 blah. If you are not creating a trust, you have no anonymity. It is what it is. A, an attorney can pierce a corporate veil. Doesn't matter if it's an LLC, a corporation, anything else. The only thing they cannot peer, uh, pierce is a trust. Okay, We are not going to talk about trusts in this uh, course. If you're worried and you want that anonymity, which I personally don't think you need if you're doing the right thing, then go search trusts. Otherwise, just purchase the LLC or the corporation in the state you live in. Okay, I live in Alabama. My LLC, Premier Apartment Services LLC, is registered in Alabama. Acquisition Pro, for now, is a DBA of Premier Apartment Services LLC. Eventually, once I bring on a partner or two, we're going to turn that into an LLC, Acquisition Pro. Okay, but for now, it and I do have it trademarked. Uh, waiting on my matter of fact, my R, the registration, the registered trademark, my R should be ready by next month. It takes about six months to get the R. Right now, it's just a TM, but it is filed and registered. So research the name on your Secretary of State. Make sure it's available because you don't want to buy this if it's not already available. If it is available, at this point, go ahead and purchase the name registration from the state. Depending on the state, uh, for the state of Alabama, it was $75. 
Um, I've bought LLCs in Florida at sunbiz.org and we've bought LLCs in Texas when we own property there. Uh, I don't remember what the costs of those uh, registrations were, but it's under a hundred bucks for most states. Okay, but go ahead and buy the registration for that state. Purchase, go ahead now, back to GoDaddy, purchase the domain name and the web hosting. Now, web hosting. What I was doing with some of my done for you clients is we were just going straight to HostGator, which is a hosting company, which you can also purchase a domain from. HostGator has changed how uh, their interface works. And that didn't seem to work as fluently as it was earlier. So for my done for you clients now, what I offer is I have a dedicated server on HostGator. I can host as many domains as I want to, and I can even host uh, other people's domains. So web hosting, if you're doing the done for you program is covered because I just put it in my server and don't charge for it. It's part of that done for you program. Um, for GoDaddy, if you purchase it with GoDaddy and then point the name servers to something like HostGator, Bluehost or something like that, it is a little easier to do, even though you would think just using HostGator would have been the right way to do it. But things change constantly. And since I created these slides, it's even changed since then. So I would recommend purchasing from GoDaddy or from Namecheap or one of those others, and then finding the web host separately because GoDaddy, and don't use GoDaddy for hosting. GoDaddy's core focus is name registration, uh, that online name registration. Bluehost, HostGator, the other hosting companies, their focus is web hosting. So get the one that, has that focus. Again, whatever it is you choose, okay? So it'll cost you 20 bucks, maybe a dollar if it's your first one for the first year and then 20 bucks a year after that. Uh, I like to purchase at least two years, sometimes three years in advance because it makes it more search engine optimization capable with Google. Google does not like one-year registrations. They think it could be a, a fake website that's gonna come down later. So um, they uh, like to see two years or more, okay? Then register your employer identification number. Do not forget your EIN. Now, the reason we have to do all this is in order to do SMS. If you want to do SMS marketing, texting, you are going to be required to have an EIN. You can do an EIN without having an LLC or a corporation. You could just be a sole proprietor. It's a little different. It's a little harder to do, but you can do that. I just recommend go ahead and put um, get that LLC. Uh, please don't draw on the screen. Um, that just kind of makes things look a little unprofessional. So please refrain from drawing on the screen. Thank you. Uh, the reason you're going to need this is because in order for us to be able to get a business email, well, again, that's for SMS. If you're not going to do SMS, you don't have to have all this done already. But this is now out of the way. It gives you credibility, all right? It gives you that legitimacy in the marketplace that you actually have an entity. So get it done anyway, even if you're not going to do SMS. As we move forward and we start talking about doing email, I'm going to explain to you why a company email is now, now, as of February 1st, mandatory. Okay. And I'll explain that here in a minute. It's no longer optional. Now it's mandatory. So make sure your web hosting company has a cPanel access because if it does, then you'll be able to create your free email addresses as many as you want inside of that web hosting company's cPanel. So HostGator's who I recommend, but there's also Bluehost. You can't go wrong with either one of them. All right, so next we have to create that new business email address and then add that to our primary email, supposed to be service provider, not viewer, 
that was a, oh yeah, add it to your viewers. So where do you receive your emails? Gmail, that's where I see all my, so David at davidmonroeccim.com. I view that email address inside Gmail. I just like the uh, way it looks, how it's organized. And I've got my calendar right there. So it keeps my calendar and my email all in the same location. Uh, even though my calendar is actually not in Gmail, people are registering through my calendar somewhere else but I see it inside of my Gmail account. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to do that. But here's the deal. And, and again, this has just come up over the last couple of weeks. Google and Yahoo starting February 1st have said, you no longer can send email messages to Google or Yahoo uh, if you do not have, and just bear with me for a second, I'm gonna throw some terms out you're absolutely not gonna know. SPF, DKIM, and DMARC uh, policy on your DNS settings. When you belong to somebody like Active Campaign or another email service provider, and you go in and you change your DNS settings to point to Active Campaign, more than likely, your SPF and your DKIM are already done. You don't need to do those again. Okay. What you are going to need, though, is a DMARC record, and it's it's a policy. So what it does is it tells Google and Yahoo um, what to do with the email if the email address bounces or if it does not exist. You can select none. You can select to um, uh, quarantine it, or you can select to reject it. Google is okay with none. Yahoo would like a more specific recommendation, but they're okay short term with it being none until uh, the system kind of gets used to doing this. Starting February 1st, if you are emailing from a free email address like a Gmail address or Yahoo or Ymail or Hotmail or any of these other ones, and you do not have a business email and you do not have the DKIM, the SPF and the DMARC policies in place, they are going to reject those emails. If it's marketing, if it's coming from Active Campaign, if it's coming from um, uh, what is uh, Get Response or Mailchimp or any of these other ones, if it's coming from them, it will get rejected. They're not even going to throw it spam; they're just going to reject it. Okay, it will not be delivered. So you cannot send from a Gmail address from any free account anymore. Right? They've rejected this. Now, why you say well? more people have emails than just Google and Yahoo. Hey, here's the numbers. Google uh, owns 60% of the email addresses in the world. 60% of the people on the planet have a Gmail address. 20% have a Yahoo address. Okay. That is 80%. Oh, let me text. I'm just going to let her know I'm outside. Hold on a second here. Okay, you Garrett, can. mute your uh, line. Thank you. 80% of people in the world have a Google or a Yahoo address. This is why I said it's no longer recommended. It is now mandatory that you have a company email address. If you want to do any marketing at all through uh, Active Campaign, through MailChimp, through GetResponse, through any of them. Doesn't matter. You must have a company email address. You must have your DKIM, your SPF, and your DMARC policy in place. All right? So uh, Acquisition Pro members, don't worry about it. I will take care of it for you, for you guys. Okay? So that's the legal side of it. So if we're using... Acquisition Pro, obviously, we're going to set up a dedicated email, and it is going to require uh, that DNS setup in your next class. And I walk you how to do that. <laughs> oh, here she go. Okay, Jared, okay here she comes. Mute yourself. Please. What's I going to eat now? I'm on your favorite cheese. You're having some cheese. All right, hold on. <laughs> hey, go eat. Bud. You good? I mean, just turn on low power mode. You good? Oops. For whatever reason, he's he keeps unmuting, and I had to boot him. I love Garrett to death, but 
Don't need the interruptions. All right. So this is why we need Bluehost or HostGator with cPanel access so we can change those DNS settings in cPanel. Again, if you're an Acquisition Pro member, I'll walk you through that whole process. All right. Next, you got to determine your entity structure. Is it going to be an LLC, an S-Corp partnership? Okay, obviously you want to consult with an attorney. Now, um, I would recommend, me personally, an LLC taxed as an S-Corp if you have the ability to do that um, or taxed as a partnership. So a, an, a true partnership, not necessarily an LLC, a true partnership is it's either a limited partnership or it's a general partnership. This is where GP and LP actually came from. GP and LP does not belong in an LLC. Those are limited members and members. Okay, managing members and limited members, not GPLP. Drives me nuts with that vernacular, but our industry seems to have uh, gravitated towards that in order to speak somebody's language. You, you got to understand all that. So a partnership is not protected by the corporate veil. You're more open. So I, I honestly, unless you're doing like a tenant in common um, joint venture partnership, uh, I would even recommend getting an LLC that is that general or limited partner. All right. That, that's just how I would do it. You want to stay away from corporations. So you don't want to file an S corp that is going to buy properties. You do not want to put, if the S corp has title to the property, you're going to get double taxed. Same with a C corp. So it's best. Now you can have an S corp or a C corp that is a managing member or to use the syndication world's vernacular, a, a general partner. And a C-Corp can be a general partner or a limited partner uh, without that. Um, it just can't hold title to the property, okay? So that I leave that up to you. Again, consult an attorney to find out what is best for you. If you register an LLC, register your articles of organization, you can do this for as little as 300 bucks. Depends on the state you're in. But uh, each Secretary of State's website will have all the forms and the process you need to go through. Typically, it'll just be the articles of organization. It's about one or two pages. You fill out that information. You take it down to the county and you register it in tripl triplicate. Okay, So the county gets one, the state gets one, you get one. But they all need to be signed and notarized, all three of them individually need to be signed and notarized. They cannot be copied, okay? So when I say in triplicate, that means your copy, the state's copy, and the county's copy all have to be individually notarized, okay? And then what they'll do is they'll take your copy, they'll put the stamp on it uh, that they have filed and give it back to you. You do not have to wait for the county to file because it may take them a week, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to actually file the paperwork with the courthouse. You do not have to wait to conduct business while they are filing. As soon as they put that stamp and you have that, now you can start operating your company. Okay. Next, you're going to want to go open your business checking account. Now, you cannot open an LLC or a corporation's business account until you have filed these documents. The bank is going to ask you for your operating agreement. All you have to tell them is that the entity was just created. Here are my, my articles of organization. We have not created an operating agreement yet. 100% of all funds goes to the managing members on the articles of organization. And they'll accept that. I've never had a bank not accept that but they are going to try to get you to give them your operating agreement. Keep in mind, the Articles of Organization is a public document. I can go to NETR online right now, go into any county's courthouse in the country, their online records, and I can pull up any LLC's Articles of Organization, but I cannot see their operating agreements. The operating agreement is a private document to 
the company. So don't give in to the bank's pressure about giving an operating agreement. If it's okay and you've done it, give it to them. That's fine. But it's not necessary. Then open all your remaining bank accounts. Okay, those buckets that we talked about. Now you have a sellable company name, lease space on the internet for it, created a company email for credibility and to actually be able to deliver emails and have a registered business ready to help you get to your monthly number. Any questions about registering an entity, registering a domain, email, anything else before we move to how to find off-market opportunities? Dave? Yes, sir. Aren't there new laws now coming in starting March that if you already have an LLC, you have to do some sort of paperwork? Yeah, you just have to, uh, that's a tax thing that's brand new. Um, when you file your um, LLC, it used to be you only had to put people that had 20% interest or more. Now you have to list everybody. That's the only difference. It's just transparency. Again, whether you get it in Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, or your own state, you just pierce the corporate veil right there. Uh, Secretary of State uh, webs any any Secretary of State website. Uh, Florida is called sunbiz.org. Can you touch on Corporate Transparency Act requirements and reporting nightmare? Uh, I, I would suggest just researching it. I'm not a corporate attorney, um, so I'm not going to go into any of that, Michael. Any other questions? Yes, sir. All right. Let's keep on going. How to find off-market opportunities using automation. All right. So hold on a second. Let me see if I can clear this stuff up here. Let me see something here. No, can't do it from there. Give me one second here. Try to get. There we go. Get that junk off of there. All right. Who can help you find off-market opportunities? Well, I like to call these folks influencers. Appraisers are my favorite. If you've never heard the story, um, my very first multifamily opportunity was a listing that I got for a 34-unit apartment complex in Mobile, Alabama. Um, and I found out about it from a friend of mine that was an appraiser. Um, he used to reach out to me and ask me for data. And in return, he would bring me opportunities when he found them before they actually went to market. So a lender had contacted him and said, hey, quietly, I'd like to get an appraisal on this property. So his assumption was that it was going to go into foreclosure. He was correct. So I reached out to the owner, built a relationship with the owner, and that became my first multifamily transaction. Uh, this was in 2013. <clears throat> so an appraiser brought me that opportunity. So do not discount building relationships with appraisers. Lenders, mortgage brokers, asset managers, hey, they're another resource for finding opportunities. If you have a really good relationship with especially a local lender and you know that bank does a lot of multifamily transactions uh, or whatever commercial property or residential that you may be doing because people are doing different things these days then build a relationship with that lender take them to lunch go to networking events with them call them up every once in a while ask them what they're doing try to give them some data about the market that they may not have and in return when they have something uh where the asset manager of the bank may want to divulge of uh, a, a loan or something like that, that lender will reach out to you and say, hey, are you interested in this? Or do you know anybody that you know that can close would be interested in this? So do not discount lenders themselves. Attorneys, 
for probate, divorce, bankruptcy. They're a wealth of information, but you've got to have a good relationship with them. Okay. Uh, it's a little harder to build relationships with these attorneys because we all know attorneys like to, you know, they, they like to think they're better than most people. Uh, but if you can provide them information that is helpful to them, they absolutely will reciprocate. CPAs are another one. They file real estate investors' taxes. They know when a real estate investor might be in trouble and might have to and may even recommend that they start selling some of their assets. So CPAs are another wealth of information. Syndicators and sponsors, okay? They own property. They buy property. So if you're building relationships with syndicators and sponsors, you may have opportunity before they reach out to a broker uh, in order to purchase that opportunity or if you find an opportunity, but it doesn't fit your criteria, you can reach out to them and offer them your off-market opportunity for a piece of the acquisition fee. So it's a win-win for everybody. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Tori, credit, credit unions. If the credit union lends to commercial real estate, some don't. Um, up until the JOBS Act, no credit unions did commercial lending. Uh, but after the Jobs Act, they actually started doing uh, more and more commercial loans. Okay, real estate brokers. Now, caveat here is if you're in buy mode, <clears throat> go boutiques, don't go national. Do not discount building relationships with national and global um, brokers, but they're not going to bring you off-market deals. They may tell you it's off-market, but they're telling you and their other three or 400 people on that contact list, the same thing. Boutique brokers, on the other hand, maybe they're just getting started in multifamily. This is really for smaller properties. If you're doing smaller uh, deals like uh, a duplex to about 20, 30, 40, 50 units, they sell properties to people that own other properties. And so a lot of times, if they've done a good job on selling a single family home or maybe a mobile home park or uh, a retail building or whatever it was they might have sold to them, then that owner may come to them and say, hey, you know, I don't want to do a full listing, but I got this 30 unit apartment complex that uh, has been a pain in my backside. And I'd really like to get rid of this thing. And I'd, you know, I'll pay a, you know, two or 3% commission if you can get rid of it quietly. So if you've built a relationship with these boutique brokers and they're a little more hungry than the national and global, then you can find opportunities from them. Okay. So do not discount them. And then finally, the owners themselves. Okay? If you are not reaching out to owners, you are limiting your ability to find opportunities. If you rely on real estate brokers and that's all you're doing, then you're going to constantly be comp competing. If you're winning deals, you're more than likely uh, overpaying for them. Um, I can say in about 95% of the cases, you are overpaying for them. Um but if you're reaching directly to owners, you can find opportunities, right? So how do we find owners? Well, we need property and ownership data, really the ownership data. We really don't need the property data. Through questioning, when we get an owner on the phone, we can find out what they own and where it is they need help, okay? Through good questioning. So we really don't need the property data. And most of... The automated tools out there, Active Campaign included, you really don't have the ability to put more than one property in the contacts database because they're people databases. They're not property databases. Now, some of the other commercial real estate CRMs like Realnex uh, or Apto or ClientLook, they have the ability to connect a person to multiple properties because they're a property database as well as being a person database, but they don't have automations. So you, you got to kind of figure out, do I want property data or do I want ownership data? Honestly, you only need ownership data. You can find all the property information you want just by asking the owner questions. So you need to identify what number of units do you want, whether it's a duplex, whether it's 10 to 50 units, whether it's 100 plus units, 300 plus units, wherever you are in your journey, 
you've got to identify what number of units you're looking for in a uh, given market, which we'll see here in a minute, so that that becomes part of your search criteria to get this ownership data. You got to know what asset classes you're going for. Are you class E value add, which I wouldn't recommend anything value add right now because of where we are in the market cycle. Um, that's a whole nother class. Uh, you can find that information on my YouTube channel on why it's important today to be paying cash flow. Okay, we're getting ready to hit a recession, whether you believe it or not. And if you're buying properties value add, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You need to buy cash flow. So you can find C properties that are cash flowing. You can find B that are cash flowing. A is going to be a little tougher. Um, that's more institutional quality. Uh, and, um, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Their yield investors typically go after your higher Bs and your As. So it just depends on what your criteria is. Okay, are you going after conventional, which is market rent, low income, student, senior? And then what markets? Pick one to three markets. I would not pick more than three markets. You can't do enough focusing and you cannot um, have enough time for follow-up if you have more than three markets. Now, that's three large markets. If you have... Three smaller markets, maybe you don't have enough markets in order to get what I call velocity. You need between 400 and 750 uh, email addresses and owners to reach out to on a consistent basis. I'd even extend that out to today's standards because of where we are in the market, nobody responding, uh, at least the majority of people not responding. You could probably go up to about 2,000 owners and that will expand your um, ability to find these off-market deals. If the market is not your market or your partner's market, you've got to have boots on the ground. Don't be the type of investor that invests from their computer. Now, if you're doing wholesaling or something like that, or you're doing um, bird dogging, then you can do that from your computer. But if you are actually going out to purchase an asset, you've got to have boots on the ground. All right. I just, that's, again, there's other sections in my courses that talk about how important that is and why that's needed. Uh, and we'll talk about that in acquisitions. When we start talking about market analysis and acquisitions, you'll understand why that boots on the ground is so important. That's tomorrow. So primary sources for finding owners, CoStar, Yardy Matrix, Reonomy, Prospect Now, and Land Vision. Okay. Uh, all of these will provide ownership data for properties. Reonomy uh, will have the most accurate for smaller properties. All of them will be accurate above about 50 units and in the top 135 markets. As a matter of fact, Yardy Matrix is only in the top 135 markets. Uh, Axiometrics, which is another, which is another multifamily data provider, they are only in the top 135 markets. Moody's Analytics, which used to be Reese, they are only in the top 135 markets. Where CoStar, Reonomy, they're in every market. Reonomy is actually in more markets than CoStar is, but CoStar breaks it down better. Prospect Now. They are not everywhere. It's hard to identify exactly where they are. They do give this like three day free period for you to test it. I just don't like Prospect Now's data. Like if you're in the state of Mississippi, forget Prospect Now. You're not gonna find any data. Uh, Mobile is okay. Florida Panhandle's okay. But there's places in the country that have gaps for Prospect Now. Land Vision is probably one of the best resources for public information for ownership data. And you get all of the land and property information with Land Vision. It's got a great search tool. I've never used it, but I got a demo from it. And I've had a couple of friends of mine that have used it and they swear by it. They love it. Me personally, for multifamily, I think CoStar is the best bet. Um, because you can go all the way down to two units and you can get access to all 396 uh, metro statistical areas as well as sub-markets 
within uh, a lot of the areas that are micro statistical areas. So that's just my own personal um, recommendation for multifamily. Yardy matrix is great if you're in a big market and you're doing 50 plus units, okay? Their data will be better than uh, CoStars, but again, Yardy matrix doesn't go under 50 units and they're only in the top 135 markets. So distress sources. I'm sorry, David, may I, may I just yep. jump in real quickly? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, because I'm a I'm a uh, real estate broker, and I yeah. do, uh, and I have a uh, co-star, you know, paying on mm -hmm. a higher end. And whenever I get uh, the, the two to four unit apartments, mm -hmm. they will not allow me to market those apartments on co-star. Uh, you know, I was able to I've been able to put them on Crexy, but for some reason they say they they said they would not allow me. And I've had a co-star for maybe to 10 years. Yeah, but you could put them on LoopNet. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. CoStar is not a listing platform. No, it isn't. It's the back end. Right. right. Okay. So, yeah. Perfect. You know, if you put something on CoStar, yeah. where it's going to get listed is LoopNet. True. True. Very right. good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Distress sources. Now, CoStar, Yardi Matrix, Real Capital or um, Moody's Analytics, which again used to be Reese. Uh, and if you're familiar with um, Catalyst, Moody's Analytics bought Catalyst. So they just started, they just got the API for CMBS data. CoStar, Yardi Matrix, they have CMBS data. Moody's Analytics has CMBS data. Only 16% uh, of all transactions since 2020 have been purchased with CMBS data. So you're missing a lot of the marketplace when you're only looking for CMBS. TREP and Real Capital Analytics both provide all capital analytic resources, uh, whether it's agency, whether it's CLO, which is a commercial uh, or a collateralized loan obligation, which is bridge debt, um, whether it's Fannie Freddie, whether it's CMBS, doesn't matter. TREP and Real Capital Analytics track it all. Um, TREP is a little bit better in the data, but Real Capital Analytics has a better search tool. Uh, neither will provide what their costs are up front. You have to get a demo from them and it's based on your specific situation. And the cost is going to be somewhere around what you pay for CoStar, maybe even a little bit more depending on how much you need. But for distressed property resources, those are the two best. If you have CoStar, CoStar has a field when you're in search, you can go to loan, from loan, you can then search for um, watch list, who's currently on the watch list and who is currently in special servicing. Uh, but again, that's only for CMBS data. Uh, you can also search um, 30 days delinquent, 60 days delinquent, 90 days delinquent. You can also search real estate owned and you can search by loan maturity date. So both CoStar and real... Um, Moody's Analytics will provide that data. I believe Yardy Matrix does as well. But TREP, Real Capital Analytics, they provide that data for all loan types. They are strictly capital markets analytics where CoStar, Yardy, and um, Moody's are uh, space markets, but provide capital market data. It's just not their specialty where it is with TREP and Real Capital Analytics. So you can use systems and automations to build relationships with influencers and use online tools to find ownership lists, then use the systems and automations in Acquisition Pro to find and win off-market opportunities. So how do you use the system to find and win deals? Well, there's some tools we need within your system. You're going to need a CRM. And it doesn't have to be Acquisition Pro, okay? That just happens to be the tool I own. It could be... Uh, MailChimp, which I highly, highly, highly do not recommend. Constant Contact, which I highly, highly, highly do not recommend. It could be MailChimp, which is okay. They got some deliverability problems. Uh, Active Campaign, which the syndication world seems to love. It is what it is. 
I was never a fan of them, but they do have a better deliverability rate than the other three I just mentioned. Um, and then there are other uh, like AWeber and some other resources get response out there that um, provide a CRM and some analytic tools, which really just comes to the email client follow-up and automations. The key to it is that when somebody enters that CRM, you need to be able to start automating that process right away. We can do that by tagging that person that comes in with a certain tag, which triggers uh, an automation sequence that starts a follow-up series for emails. You can do the same thing for SMS. If you've gotten your A2P 10 DLC registration from the Federal Trade Commission, Again, you have to have that and you've got to have an EIN number in order to get that approved. You have to have that in order to send any SMS marketing. What you cannot do, we can send cold email. So if you upload a list, you can send cold email. Uh, you just have to have certain things like your address and an unsubscribe. And of course, now the SPF, the DKIM and the DMARC uh, requirements on top of that, as long as those are in place, you can send cold email. But with the new laws that went in effect September 1st, which was a federal government regulation, which was lobbied by the cell phone companies, you can no longer send cold SMS messages. Trust me, you do not want to be fined because I, I heard it's like $500 for every SMS message that the FTC gets a complaint for. So if you send out 5,000 SMS messages, then, uh, and, 150 of them complain and the FTC finds out about it, you get $500 per occurrence. You don't want to be that person. So make sure you go through that registration and then you still can't do cold. Yet they have to agree to receive SMS messages from you, which SMS client for follow-up automations. Acquisition Pro, we use Twilio. That's where we get your phone number from. It's also where we register the A2P 10 DLC registration process. Twilio approves it, sends it to the Federal Trade Commission so that you are approved. It takes anywhere from 48 hours to a week, depending on how new your company is. Uh, Susan asked, what do you mean by space markets? That's units. Units are space. So rent, absorption, uh, construction, deliveries, uh, occupancy, uh, number of units, the, these are all space market data points. Does that make sense, Susan? Uh, cap rate, price per unit, um, sale price, uh, loan information, those are all capital market data points. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Because we have Twilio, we also have an auto dialer. Now, here's the key with auto dialers. Does anybody, and this is for everybody that's on right now, and there, let's see, there's currently 64 of you on here. Is there anybody here when they get a phone call and they pick it up and they say hello, or this is David, or whatever it is you say, and there's nothing there, and you know that you've been auto dialed, do you hang up or do you sit there and wait for that company to? be able to pitch you whatever it is they're pitching you. Hang up, hang up. Yeah, you hang up, right? So there are auto dialers out there that you can purchase that will allow you to dial hundreds of numbers at a time until one person picks up and connects you with that. Now, if three or four pick up at once, guess what happens to the other three? Let's say four pick up at once but you get connected to one, guess what happens to the other three? Hangs up on them. Now, how pissed off is that prospect? You think you're ever going to be able to do anything with that person in the future? No. So I absolutely do not recommend those type of auto dialers. Our auto dialer and acquisition pro is they reach a point in the sequence where we're now trying to follow up with them. So as they come in, they get the email messages, they get the SMS messages if they've agreed to receive them, and they get put into a call queue. 
So you have the ability to go into that call queue because you can talk right from your computer on Acquisition Pro. You don't need any other phone client. You just hit start and it just starts going down the queue. Let's say you have 50 people in there. You hit start, it dials the one at the top. That person either answers the phone or doesn't or it goes to voicemail. A box comes up and says, all right, what was the result of the call? It was either completed, meaning you talked to them, or it was a voicemail, or it was uh, a no answer. However you select it, it moves you to the next point into the process of the pipeline automatically. So what the system does is if it was completed, then it moves them into the next step. If it was voicemail or uh, did not answer, it just takes them from number one to number 50 and auto dials that next call until you pause it, okay? So that way you never miss the follow-up call because you just go down the list and it just puts them right in order. And you just continue for the amount of times that you set in the system that you wanna try to reach out to them. Um, so that kind of auto dialer absolutely works. And if you're using a VA to do it, and they have a good script, it's perfect for this auto dialer because they don't need to know anything other than to go into your system, hit start, and just deliver their script for the ones that answers and know how to hit the, the three questionnaire when it pops up, and that's it. Pipeline tracking. Where are they in the pipeline? Are they a new lead? Uh, are you trying to contact them? Um, have you reached them? So now we're trying to schedule that appointment. Have they scheduled an appointment? Did they not show and canceled the appointment? Uh, are we putting them in nurture? Are they warm, hot? Have you won the uh, assignment? Whatever that is, whether it's a listing, whether it's an off-market opportunity, whether it's an investor, that's the pipeline, okay? With Acquisition Pro, we can move the prospect all the way through the pipeline without you touching anything all you need to do is hold conversations and that's it. Once this thing's set up, you're just holding conversation. The system does everything else. Calendar. There is a calendar built in to Acquisition Pro and it ties to everything, including when they schedule an appointment, it moves them automatically to the scheduled appointment part of the pipeline. There's a page builder. Okay, so I don't want you to get hung up on building websites or anything else, but to get people to agree to receive marketing messages from you so you can SMS them, then you're going to need a landing page that you can send people to from social media, from LinkedIn, or from whatever it is you're doing. If you're good enough to run ads and you want to run ads, then you're going to send them to a landing page. We've got a page builder built into it. If you want to build a complete website, you can in Acquisition Pro. I don't recommend it. You don't need a complete website. If you've ever, if you've recently gone to davidmonroeccim.com, that is where websites are going. People just want to know how they can get a hold of you. That's it. So Acquisition Pro has all these components built in and tied together with automations. So finding and winning the opportunities, we need an e uh, automated email follow-up campaign, which is a nine, in Acquisition Pro, it's a nine e uh, week automated follow-up sequence and it's already built in. Uh, we've got automated ringless voicemail. So you can email them, send them a text, send them a voicemail, still haven't reached them, start to call them using the auto dialer. Okay, already built into Acquisition Pro. We have automated SMS follow-up campaigns. I don't recommend more than about a, a four to five week campaign. The one that I have uh, created is a five week se uh, sequence and it's already built into Acquisition Pro. So with your calendar and pipeline inside Acquisition Pro tied to the CRM and automated follow-up campaigns, all you have to do is hold appointments and win deals. That's it. All right, any questions about finding off-market opportunities? Again, Underwriting goes beyond the scope of what we're doing today. My apologies, there just isn't enough time to put it in. No questions? All right, let's talk about the six creative acquisition methods. All right, so these go beyond 
the typical just submit an offer, negotiate, and do a uh, a standard closing where you're putting money down. Maybe you're raising capital for that money. Maybe you're not. Maybe you have a couple of partners. You're putting the money in. You got earnest money. Uh, you do your due diligence. You get your loan um, and you close the deal. That's a standard transaction. This goes beyond the standard transaction. Some alternative ways, some creative ways that if you can't get a loan, especially where we are in the market today, what creative ways can we use to try to acquire the property? The first is master lease option. Here's where we negotiate a master lease with an option to purchase. Okay, there are two separate contracts. The master lease is a lease agreement where you're leasing every single unit in the apartment complex, really subleasing, but it's considered a master lease. Um, so you become the lessor or the lessee, the landlord or the owner is the lessor, you become the lessee, and then all the residents in the uh, apartment complex become sub lessees per the master lease agreement, right? And then we have an option to purchase, meaning at a point in time in the future, uh, you um, are potentially going to purchase this asset, but you're negotiating at today's market value. So with a master lease, that is a uh, that is a bilateral agreement, meaning both of you are bound by the agreement. With the option to purchase, that is considered a unilateral agreement. You get the option, not the owner. The owner must comply with the option agreement. You have the option to either exercise the option and purchase the deal or to get out of it at any point before the expiration date of the term. Typically, it's 12 months to five years. I like three years. Three years is a magical number for me because lenders want three years of financials, three years of history. And if you've been operating the property over the last three years, it becomes really easy for you to qualify for a loan when it's time to purchase the asset if you so desire. This can become a true no money down strategy because when you get ready to purchase it three years from now, if you're escrowing on a monthly basis portions of the uh, operating income, now you're going to have to pay the owner uh, for the debt or the owner will agree to let you pay the lender directly. You got to be careful doing that. Uh, either way, there's risk either way. Then... You've got the operating expenses and whatever's left over is for you. That's your cash flow before tax. If you would take a percentage of that every single month and put it into an escrow account, at the end of three years, more than likely you have enough for a down payment when it comes time for you to purchase that asset. That puts this into a true no money down strategy and you do not need partners in order to purchase this. You can purchase it on your own and own a 30-unit apartment complex as the sole owner. Now we're making some cash flow. Next is wraparound mortgage. This is the true way to do a subject two. The way you're taught to do subject two in a lot of these Facebook groups and the way these, uh, what's this guy's name, Pace Morby and all this other crap, they are teaching you the illegal way to do subject two. This is the legal structure for subject two. It's called a wraparound mortgage. It uses a land trust, okay? Six states have specific rules to land trusts and you can just Google to figure out who they are, but... When you utilize a land trust, you're given the opportunity to become the operator of the property. The owner still owns it, okay? But the key here is that there's no transfer of title, which means the due on sale clause will not trigger, okay? The loan must be assumable in this case. 
So a land trust is a legal entity that takes ownership of or authority over a piece of property at the request of the property owner. Land trusts are living trusts that allow for the management of property while the owner is still alive. Okay. And again, because you're not taking title, the due on sale clause does not trigger. Purchase money mortgage is owner financing. Oops, forgot to... Oh, that, that's part of this. Uh, it requires permission from the primary lender. So this is you negotiate owner financing from the owner because you don't have, you either don't have enough to close the deal or you're just trying to get a good opportunity. You've got a really motivated owner that needs to get out of this thing. And so, or maybe they don't own anything on the property or very little. So now we can do what's known as a purchase money mortgage, which is owner financing requires permission from the primary lender if there is a lender involved uh, when you purchase the asset. If you can do it 100% owner financing because they don't have any debt on the property, that's the best way to do it. But if there is loan uh, that you're acquiring with, you must get permission from that primary lender in order to get a purchase money mortgage. Okay, So if all or... Uh, little to no loan exists, then you can use this strategy. LLC partnerships, you become a member of the existing LLC. So the owner has an LLC or a corporation, whatever. And he's tired, doesn't want to deal with this anymore. Um, maybe the situation is it wouldn't make sense to purchase the asset right now for a number of reasons, but you want to take over operations and not trigger a due on sale clause. Now they just bring you in through a, um, oh, what, what do we call a, an LLC document? Um, eh, brain farting, can't think of what it's called at the moment. But you just write into the LLC where you're bringing on a new manager. And it's not an amendment. Uh, it's called something else. I think it starts with an R if I remember right. Resolution. Thank you, Tori. Resolution. So you create a resolution uh, for the LLC that allows you to become a managing member of that LLC, right? So after establishing relationship with the lender, you can just buy out the owner. Okay, so that becomes a pretty easy way to own a property for an owner that is tired, motivated, doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Hey, Dave, for those creative financing uh, opportunities that we run across where we have to get permission from the lender, what type of consideration should we be really thinking about in those transactions? Is there anything in particular that the lenders are looking for or things that we can do to kind of help boost our, our chance for success? Um, they're definitely going to want consideration. So earnest money. Uh 1% is typical. I know you see 2 3% these days, uh, non or um, hard day one. I wouldn't worry about that hard day one. That's going to go away for a while as we get into all the foreclosures and everything else. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities where you're not going to have to worry about that hard day one. That That is in a expansion market. We are no longer in an expansion market. Um, so I think you're going to start to see that go away. But you just have to just ask them, what do you need? What do you need from me? Every lender is going to be different. So let them tell you. And if you can accommodate it, then you don't have to worry about it. Just provide them that information and they may give you that approval. Uh, but there are some lenders uh, that will not allow, like uh, Fannie Freddie. They do not allow purchase money mortgages. What they will allow is for a... Um, for a, an amendment, what's it called? Uh, ah, brain farting today. Um, starts with an A. It's not amendment or addendum. Um, oh, if you guys help me out, figure out what it's called. It's not an assessment. Mm, brain farting today. Anyway, uh, they'll allow up to two of those in order to be able to purchase the asset, especially on a assignment. Thank you. Uh, is it assignment? No, it's not assignment. Um, in order to purchase uh, a property that you get with a uh, an assumable mortgage. Uh, so um, I 
brain fart and I don't know why I can't think today. Probably because I'm still slightly hung over from um, Mardi Gras. But does that answer your question? It does. So it's no one hard, fast rule. Um, it just depends on the lender, whether we get agency debt or someone else. Yeah, agency debt's not going to allow you to get the money from the owner, but they'll allow the, oh, I can't believe I can't remember what it's called. And you can have two of them. Um, no worries, no worries. You just can't go above the, uh, or below the DSCR or above the loan to value, whichever is lower um, in order Understood. to get to that point. Okay, thanks. All right, contract for deed. It's a land contract. This is really similar uh, to the one we had earlier. Um, title does not transfer, so due on sale clause does not trigger. And a contract for deed is a contract for sale of land, which provides that the buyer will acquire possession of the land immediately. That includes any improvements on the land and pay the purchase price in installments over a period of time but the seller will retain legal title until all payments are made. Also termed as an installment land contract, a land contract, or a land sales contract. This is similar to the master lease option strategy, but instead of leasing the property, uh, you're, you're basically doing um, a rent to own, if you will, where the principal is going down every single month that you make payments to the owner where that's not the case because you're just leasing in a master lease, all right? But this is another way you can do that. Typically with these contracts, there's going to be um, a little bit larger of a down payment than what would just be earnest money. Then we have hard money, bridge, and preferred equity. Numbers must work on the deal, okay? Now, hard money is really bridge for, so hard money is considered hard money for residential. Bridge is considered hard money for commercial, even though there's more um, applications for bridge than uh, just purchase. As a matter of fact, bridge wasn't even created for acquisition. Bridge lenders just saw the opportunity in this last expansion. Where bridge really came from was you uh, purchase a piece of land to do development. The initial part of development, you get a construction loan. As you start to do lease up and you get that certificate of occupancy, at that point, a bridge lender would come in and allow you to refinance out the construction loan and be able to pay back the investors that help you through that development process until you get fully leased up, at which time you would then bridge into a permanent loan. So that's where the term bridge came from. But these lenders, uh, after about 2019, before COVID, they identified that they were really missing an opportunity with all the acquisitions with value add projects. So they started lending on acquisitions, all right? You, you would get that every once in a while prior to that, but 2019, it became the strategy and primarily because Guru said, this is what you should do. It is also the reason that we're going to have a ton of foreclosures in 2024 because of all the people that bought Bridge at three and a quarter debt, uh, three and a quarter interest for three years interest only. Okay, Those loans are all coming due in 2024. So stand by. It's going to be an exciting year. They're higher risk, especially preferred equity. Okay. Or if the market shifts on you, like with bridge, higher risk because these lenders want their loans back. They want their money back. They're not typical lenders. They are private entities, okay? especially preferred equity. And the reason with preferred equity is because there's a clause in the contract that uh, states, if you screw up, we can fire the sponsor and they can take over the deal. So it becomes really, really risky when you're using preferred equity. And when you're using preferred equity, your primary lender is going to require approval for you to be able to even get preferred equity. And the reason is, is because that primary lender, yeah, loan to own, you got it, Irish. Uh, the primary lender wants to have a relationship with that preferred equity 
because they know that the preferred equity entity can take over the project. So that existing relationship needs to exist. That's why it's really hard to get a preferred equity deal if you've not reached out to your primary lender and asked who are your preferred equity providers. Trying to build that relationship up uh, on the back end where the lender doesn't know them yet, but you're trying to get that relationship built before closing is going to be too difficult. And I've known a couple of people who have tried and it has not worked. Okay, So they've got to have that previous relationship. All right. Any questions on the six alternative strategies? There are more, but these are the primary. All righty. Well then, let's talk about some action steps. So identify your monthly number, okay? It all starts there. Find out how much do you need as an entrepreneur in order to live the lifestyle you want to desi you desire or to quit your W2 so that you could become a full-time entrepreneur. Research and determine your company name. Lease your online space and create your business email, which, as I said, in on 10 days from today, if you do not have a business email and you're delivering email from an email service provider like MailChimp, Constant Contact, Get Response, Active Campaign, or any of the others, your emails will not be delivered to Google or Yahoo. Register your business entity and open your bank accounts. Start collecting owner contact lists and upload to Acquisition Pro or whatever system you're using uh, and let the system do the work for you. Research and become skilled in the six alternative acquisition methods. Look at that. Seven minutes early. Wow. Can you go back to slide, please? Ha <laughs> ha. You guys will get copies of these slides. There you go. Oh, you're lagging, Susan. It's there. Garrett, you have your hand up. Hey, David, just real quick. Just want to find out um, what actually caused the situation for all of these loans, to, you know, come and do on all these multifamily properties. Because the people that purchased them were followers and not students and didn't realize that uh, they were at risk of market changes. And so when the market changed, they thought they'd be able to refi these things out. Um, yes, Tim, to both. Uh, so when the market changed, uh, the situation for them changed. Not only did the market change where interest rates more than doubled, um, which allowed them the inability to refi because they thought they could refi at 5% uh, and do a cash out refi. It also eliminated the ability for them to be able to sell their assets because when you need to sell for a four cap and interest rates on your loan are a six and a half to seven cap, those numbers don't work and they're not going to work in any situation. That is called negative leverage. Um, and so where they thought they could survive through this with a plus one, plus one, they quickly realized from the ones that are already in this position and have asked for that plus one, the lenders have come out and said, okay, you want your plus one? This is the money I'm losing if uh, we don't take interest rates to here. So I'm going to make you pay that up front. And they're having to do capital calls to try to get that money to at least give them one more year. And in some, some situations, the lenders aren't even doing that because that plus one was an option. And it didn't hit the brain housing groups of all these syndicators that got the plus one, plus one. They thought it was automatic. It's not, it's optional. The lender has the option, you have the option. Well, guess what? Markets changed. And so now, 18% of all multifamily assets, over 500,000 properties at the time in the marketplace in 2021, 18% of those deals, uh, of those properties traded in 2021. Almost 100,000 properties. That's like something like 88,000 plus properties traded in 2021. 68% of them 
traded with bridge debt. I'll let you do your own math. Yep, that's oh, correct, God. Irish. You hit the nail on the head. All right, I assume we're done with this slide. So I can go back to Q&A. Okay. It's on you guys now. I am here for you. Ask your questions. Hi, David. This is Garth. And uh, first of hey, all, appreciate all the information. Um, where is the market more saturated um, where you think the most deals would be had? <laughs> Texas. Uh, up Texas. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, give me three more. Three more uh, states. Oh, I just think about where syndicators have purchased in the last four years. Texas, well, Southeast, anything in the Southeast. Um, Mississippi, okay. not so much. There, there weren't a lot of transactions in Mississippi. So other than Mississippi, just about every other state in the Southeast was blanketed with okay. acquisitions. Uh, Florida is going to be a bit of a problem because of insurance. So Houston obviously hit really, really hard with insurance. And it really, it's anywhere along the Gulf Coast. If you are in a coastal county along the Gulf Coast, uh, your insurance went from uh, a little over a year ago at $600 a door to almost $2,000 a door. Wow. Um, and that is a huge hit to your NOI. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are not acquiring in coastal counties or Florida for that reason. Um, the Carolinas, another place where we're going to see a lot. And other than the Southeast, Phoenix or Arizona, um, some Vegas and the Midwest, Ohio, uh, Indianapolis, or in, you know, Indiana, Ohio, uh, and markets around there, um, are going to see quite a few transactions because there were a bunch that were acquired in this time frame in the Midwest. Thank you. Yes, Tennessee, Andrew, uh, especially Nashville. Hey, David. Uh, hey, David. Jesus, your hand up. Hold on. Jesus has had his hand up. Oh. Let him first. Yeah, David. Good morning. Morning, sir. Um, yeah, so uh, I just had a question about the mass release you were mentioning. The is it is it a better strategy to do mass release options on two to four units versus a uh, anything under fifty? I, I'd release? say up up to about thirty units or whatever you can handle by yourself. Okay. Um, and by handling yourself, I mean hiring a property management company to do it for you, but you're able to manage that management company. Um, the, the less experience you have, the more I would say that's probably not a, a strategy that you want to use, um, okay. unless you partner with somebody with experience. Got it. So you, uh, you become the operator of the property and you're going to have to pay that master lease to that owner, no matter what. So if you screw up and you can't make that payment, then the owner's just going to take the property back. Okay, so um, just I don't want to take much of your time, but I know so I, an opportunity came to me yesterday about uh, it's a fourplex uh, here in California, <clears throat> and but she's a foreclosure, so she she owes about uh, half a million dollars in arrears, um, and uh, she's a foreclosure for this year for actually I think either this Friday or next Friday, but she she's all she's open for that thing that you that you talked about about doing the a land or the doesn't, to you, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't work if she gets foreclosed on because the bank owns the property now. Yeah, so the, we're, what, what we're trying to do is stop the foreclosure. That, uh, what, 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 what are these solutions was to we, stop the foreclosure? The process. only way you're going to stop the foreclosure is to pay what's in arrears. Correct, yes. And, that, that's, what, and that's why I, I was asking this question because if, we, if I bring like a private money lender that would fund the, the, the half a million dollars, to stop the foreclosure, would it would the best strategy is to do a lease option on this property or just acquire it, you know, as a cash purchase, 
Um, yeah, I, if you if you can do it and get it for the loan amount, if it, I mean, the numbers got to work. But if the correct. numbers work and you can purchase this thing for the loan amount, then that may be the best way to go. Okay. Okay, so you're saying that because she's open for the thing you're talking about, subject to or whatever. So yep. she owes about uh, two hundred and something yep. thousand at a pre, at I think like a five percent interest, um, and but she owes like five hundred thousand. That's why she's getting foreclosed on. Uh, that we need to take care of those arrears. So we're, we're talking least, almost two hundred thousand a unit. What are the rents? Uh the rents are about. Uh, uh, I was told yes. This this just happened to me yesterday. So uh, the, um, I believe the rents were around twenty two hundred each. So we make that about work. yeah. So it's obviously the fourplex. So I'm I'm just trying to figure out a, a solution, not just for the seller, but also uh, see what would be the best solution for for us if we're going to be in the acquisition side or either sell it to somebody else or you know. Well, if you guys acquire it, you probably can acquire it without the five hundred thousand directly from the lender for the loan amount. Um, but what the lender will do is they will um, issue a ten ninety nine to the owner for the five thousand five hundred thousand that would be forgiven. Mm. So those five hundred thousand needs to be taken care of before or no? They I guess so. Yeah. If you purchase the property, you can, it's called mm -hmm. a short sale. So it doesn't matter sale. what she owns in back. You look at the lender and you say, what is it going to take for me to purchase this deal? You could probably negotiate it at or very close to what the loan amount is. And they can at least get that off their books. But for whatever the 500,000 up to that point that they forgive, what they'll do is they'll issue a 1099 to the owner and she'll have to pay tax on that as if it was income because mm. they're forgiving that debt. Some lenders, and I think California is the a type of state that allows a lender to go after the uh, owner if it was foreclosed on or repossessed or anything like that. I, again, brain farting. I can't remember anything today. Um, and I can't remember what that's called. Uh, but... Um, I was able to negotiate a couple of times where the lender didn't do that um, and let the owner get forgiven of that debt, but they still issued that owner a 1099 for tax liability. They have to. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, bud. Uh, All right. Somebody else hyped in. Who was next? Hey, David. So I know you recommended a book in the beginning. Um, is there any other resources that you recommend? Maybe courses from CCIM or anything of that nature? Oh, no, I'll always recommend CCIM. Number one, before me, before anybody, CCIM. You will learn the fundamentals. Any Without the fundamentals, tactics are BS. Right. Anything for underwriting? Any course in particular? CCIM. But the number of the course, I mean, if you remember... Oh, well, 101 is financial analysis. So it's okay. the uh, it's introduction to financial analysis. Um, so you get all of the terms and everything. Uh, then 103 is user analysis, which wouldn't benefit us unless we're doing um, single tenant net lease or we're buying our or we're leasing our own space or buy versus lease and that kind of stuff. That's user analysis. And 104 is investor analysis. So 101, 102, which is what I teach, market analysis, and 104. And the reason you need market analysis is because the results of your market analysis become the inputs for your financial analysis. Makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good question. Anyone else? Well, we still got 61 people here, so you got to have questions. I know you're not here just to see this. Yeah. yeah David, I oh, David, I... Go ahead, Joyce. Yeah, I just asked you a question. You said that presently you're a passive investor. 
um, that means you're letting someone else do the heavy listing, lifting. Is that what made you decide to do that? Do you no longer syndicate yourself? No, syndication is a job. <laughs> I was not interested in a job. Okay. Um, it is not easy. No matter what these gurus make you believe, it is yeah. not easy to syndicate. Uh, the risk involved, the stress, and you don't get paid very much. You get paid on the back end, but you do not get paid very much on the front end at all, if anything. Uh, it's not worth it. You make more money as a real estate broker than you ever will as a syndicator um, if you manage your money correctly. Uh, but it is a stepping stool if you want to build a large multifamily company. You kind of don't have a choice. You got to go that route. Um, I... Hold on, I'm not, let me let me let me okay. finish answering. So, uh, I've done the JV thing. I've I've owned on my own. Um, I've master leased. I've flipped. Uh, never wholesale the deal. Didn't really see the benefit in that. And you got to be careful as a broker because that can um, get uh, misconstrued as a uh, violation of code of ethics. But um, I'm just at the point where. My companies that I have, I have two companies. One is my real estate education company, and now I have Acquisition Pro. Between two of those, I've uh, made about five times more than I ever did in brokering or investing. Uh, so it was a really easy decision to just say my proceeds from that, I can invest into deals that make sense. Now, obviously, nothing has made sense to me since about 2016, 2017. Deals just got really stupid and they got dumber and dumber and dumber as we went along. Now, the opportunities will start to present themselves again. And when they do, and I've got an opportunity with somebody I've taught how to underwrite and how to be an asset manager and operate a property, then I would feel comfortable investing with them so my money can make money for me. Um, but I probably will never actively invest in real estate again. Uh, because I don't need another job. The job I have is uh, wonderful and I make way more than I ever did in real estate. Uh, well, I've, I've been trying to figure out where I can fit in. And I do think that it's much harder than all of these gurus say. Of and a lot of them, a lot of them do speak of successes of the students. But then if you follow up, sometimes you hear a truly different picture. And um, I am thinking, I am going the way of a passive investor. But um, can you build up a big enough business to have a, a an ongoing income from passive investments? And how much investment do you actually need to do that? Well, that's where doing your knowing your monthly number for one yes. starts. And then uh, I would recommend if you do not have a company that you trust explicitly, yes, to um, invest your money for you. I would look at more institutional level investments. Um, you get a lower return, they're yield investors, uh, but um, it's a longer term deal. Today, these these guys are investing for 12 months to 36 months if they can get rid of it. Um, and you're not getting any cash flow during that time because they didn't underwrite the deal correctly. So you're only making money even as a passive investor on the back end. Hopefully, I you're see. making money on the back end. So I would not invest in any syndication companies as a passive investor uh, unless you understand all the risks and know exactly what you're getting into. Um, but if you want to be a passive investor, investing with institutions or if you have a joint venture partner or somebody where you're just the money person on that okay. partnership, then that could be a good way for you to go as well. Okay. And when you mention institutions, is there like a top one that comes to mind or? Uh, well, I mean, Black BlackRock and Blackstone are the two biggest. Greystone's another one. Graystar. These are all really good ones. Lincoln Property Group. Mm -hmm. They could be public or private, but um, you're, you don't see them investing in the Southeast because, well, they haven't since about 2019 because- the syndication groups just started overpaying for deals because their gurus told them it was okay to do that because the market would come to them. And they were right for a little while. Then interest rates started going up. Well, eh, it didn't happen anymore. So um, wow. their institutions are all sitting on the sidelines right now just laughing because they're going to suck all these deals up. Wow. As they come to foreclosure, the 200 plus, oh yeah. 
they'll all go to institutions. And if you wanted to research, if someone is syndicating something and you want to research it, would you recommend that, um, you know, something like you take your financial analysis course or market analysis course in order oh, yeah. to, to understand what their offerings? Yeah. And the other thing you got to be careful of is um, a lot of them won't show you their numbers. Uh -huh. And if they're not showing you the numbers, what are they hiding and why are they hiding it? They don't show me the numbers. I'm not investing with them, period. I see. I thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good questions. All right. So let me go to the question box here. Uh, earlier, you okay. So that was just answered. Susan answered that. David, does the auto dialer function simply require a headset with a microphone? Any other? No, that's it. So like I'm talking to you right now, I have this microphone and I've got my speakers. I can use that to use my auto dialer. Uh, there's also with Acquisition Pro, there's an app for that. So you can use the auto dialer on your cell phone by going through uh, your uh, conversations and getting to the auto dialer from your conversations on your cell phone. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good question. All right. Uh, how do we suck some of these deals up? You got to be paying attention, Susan. Um, having access to uh, Real Capital Analytics or TREP could be um, a leg up so that you're monitoring what's going on uh, as these deals start to go south. Building relationships with the appraisers, the lenders, the mortgage brokers. and trying to reach out and have conversations with owners themselves. What else you guys have? No other questions? If, yeah. if you have one, I'm sorry, go ahead. Monitoring. I'll wait. Oh, okay, thanks, I'm sorry. So yeah, Montemarie from New York. I just had a, a question about the master lease um, creator strategy that you talked about. Yeah. Um, like in, in reality, how how often do those deals get done with, you know, no, you always hear no money out of pocket, no money up front, et cetera. Does that really yeah. happen? And if it does, you know, what are the circumstances usually? Yeah, the the no money is rare, 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 rare. Okay. Um, even with a master lease, uh, you could try to get it with no money, but Typically, even in a in a master lease, you're going to have some money down. Look, to make a contract legal, there has to be consideration. Um, if there's no consideration, it's not a legal contract. And typically, transfer of money is consideration. Um, so all these no money down deals, I mean, what they're saying is you could be a sponsor on a deal and you can raise capital for 100% of your down payment or your capital requirements, but what are the chances that you're going to be able to raise 100% if you're not putting any money in yourself? Probably nil to none. Um, you may have seen that early on, but you're not going to see it today. So uh, consideration does not have to be money. That is correct, Susan. But there has to be an exchange of consideration in order for a contract to be legal. And what, what percentage of the purchase price or whatever you agree on is that typically? It's just, yeah, I mean, $10 is considered consideration. And you, look, there were people throwing the, the $10 earnest money thing strategy out with single family investments, what, back in 2014, 15, 13, the, that time frame for flips uh, or wholesaling. Uh, if you could get an owner to agree with that, then um, that worked. But uh, typically... Uh, you're not going to find somebody that's going to agree to a $10 earnest money. Um, what is, or at least was typical prior to about 2019 was 1% of the purchase price. That's typical. Can be negotiated above or below. Just depends on the situation. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, David. Thank you very much for the amazing presentation. I have a question. Um, your personal um, perspective related to the interest rate that maybe the tendency is to be to lowering a little during 2024 
maybe the election year uh, have an, an influence on that. Uh, no. Do you th no, you don't think that? Okay. Do you think that, that the interest rate will no. lower a little? A little. It'll fluctuate like it's been doing. 10 years been going up and down. Okay. Your loan products are based off the tenure. Um, it was going down, down, down for a little while, went all the way down to what, 3.8, uh, the oh. tenure did. Then it went up oh. to 4.15 last week. Now it was down to 4.06 today. It, it's going to fluctuate. Whether the Fed decides to do a quarter point drop or not, and there was a, a Fed governor last week that said uh, the earliest we might see a rate drop would be third or fourth quarter of 2024. But by the time that actually hits the syndication groups that owe, it's too late. There's no way that these that the interest rates are going to come down far enough to save these guys. They're toast. Understood. Understood. All righty. Thank you very hey, much. I have another hey, question. Hold on, Richard. Let, let her finish. I'll get you in a second. Okay. The second one is... um. Since apparently it's very risky, apparently no, it is very risky to invest through syndications. Why do so many people do that type of business if it's not only risky, but legally, but also uh, involves a lot of work and, and lower return? Why is so popular? Um, they've been promised a get rich quick. And they see these successes that people are on these boats and in these helicopters and in front of these Maseratis, which you could rent from anybody. Uh, and, and it gets uh, glorified. Um, so I think that helps sell the idea. Um, and when you're telling people to spend more money on the property than it's worth, and you can convince investors that it is worth what you're buying it for, then um, it gives them the opportunity to purchase it that way. And that's what has happened since about 2019. Really a little earlier than that, but it really caught traction in 2019. Um, and they're going to suffer. They're going to pay the price for it. And that's what's coming. Hopefully, the ones that really didn't know any better don't go to jail, but there's going to be a threat of a bunch of these syndicators that may go to jail because of fraud. And where can fraud be put into this? Well, you guys, I'm sure, have all heard the term average annual return. Anybody not heard the term average annual return? Yes, I heard about it. Right? Okay. So what is the average annual return? By definition, what is the average annual return? The return is you it, get per year? Well, that, that's what they like to make you believe it is. Yeah. So but average is there a annual return is used in the equities market, on the stock market, that looks at your overall portfolio of all your assets on the stock market and you can determine what your average annual return is by looking over that entire asset portfolio. That's where average annual return is used. Has anybody here taken a university financial analysis course? Or CCIM? Anyone? Just finished up the fundamentals, about to go to 101. Okay. Did, was average annual return mentioned anywhere in that course? I don't recall, but I would think it would might be uh, when you look at the um, internal rate of return, either a five mm -hmm. or 10 year disposition. Yeah. Is that yeah. it, so internal rate of return is different than average annual return, the way it's being used in the syndication world. So average annual return was made up by a guru. I don't know which one made it up, but it was made up by a guru to make the cash flows look better than they are. Now, if the SEC investigates because investors are complaining because they didn't get their money back, when they investigate and they read the 
private placement memorandum and they see that term average annual return. And if they're smart and they are, and they identify that the average annual return is not a function of a real estate investment, it is only there to make the cash flows look better than they are. What is that called? Fraud. Fraud. And how many PPMs that have been done since 2019 have average annual return in it? You can say just about all of them. You'd probably be right. None of us know the answer to that, but it's what's being taught. It is only a tool to make the investors more comfortable in the investment. That's it. It does not exist in real estate investing. CCIM doesn't teach it. And none of the MBA programs in any university around the country teach it for investing in real estate. It is only used when looking at your entire asset portfolio in the equities market. That's it. You make the determination from there. Oh, uh, Richard, you are next, then Michael. Thank you. Okay, yes, with, with, with the potential um, uh, well, closures that may be coming up, is anybody in the government looking that, uh-oh, this could have a tremendous effect on the, our economy, correct? Yeah, sure they are. And they're having conversations with lenders and they're asking lenders. Now, these are banks. Government doesn't have control over private investors. But they're looking at these banks that have made bridge loans or other loans, which banks don't usually do bridge loans. Um, but if they have or uh, other types of loans, they have asked them to look at doing workouts before foreclosing. They are having those conversations with lenders, banks. But the majority of the bridge debt came from private investors. Federal government has no control over them. Good question, Richard. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, what my question was going to be is on the flip side of, of the uh, acquisitions. And that is, if you're- Talk going louder, to... Michael, please. I'm sorry? Can't hear you. Can you talk louder? Uh, does, does this work? Am I good? Let me make yeah, sure we... my volume's up. Okay. We got you. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, but the question was going to be on the flip side is as you're doing the numbers and it seems to make more sense to dispose as opposed to acquire. Uh, what do you, what would you say are the best um, or the, the top ways to explore uh, maximizing your, you know, your best to sell of your investment as far as like resources, whether they're networking or software or, you know, uh, any type of media? We are going to cover that on okay. day three in well, the deal. Then. <laughs> okay. I'll be there. Roger that. Anyone else? And for those wanting access to the underwriting class every Saturday, Charles is going to be here on Wednesday uh, helping me teach uh, on operation side. Uh, so just remind him and he'll he'll give you guys how to get access to his Saturday workshop that he does every week. And they are excellent. The Saturday if, you, are excellent. if you go through my fundamental underwriting, and combine that with Charles' use of a financial analysis tool, you become very powerful in understanding the process. Any other questions? Yeah, David, I have two questions. Hey, okay, Joyce, go ahead. Joyce, yes. In reference to buying in the Southeast, um, most of the population was moving to the Southeast. So where are these institutions investing in if it's not the Southeast? The primary markets, DC, New York, LA, San Francisco, you still have people investing in those markets, but they don't have to compete with anybody other than themselves in those markets. And they're, um, they're opportunistic, which means that they'll look for yield investments. They'll look for anything they can to put their money to work. And they don't need as much of an internal rate of return 
as uh, non-institutional entities because their discount rate, which basically just means the rate they need to satisfy their investors uh, is much smaller. So they look at what's called their weighted average cost of capital. Um, and they look and see that as long as the yield that they can get on an investment exceeds their weighted average cost of capital, then that's a deal that they'll do. So they underwrite differently than we underwrite. I see. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, my next question is on these um, triple net lease properties, commercial properties, yep. where you have, let's say, um, a CVS that you have owned the property and CVS triple net leases it. Yep. I understand a lot of people uh, have done very well with buildings like that, but with a lot of things going online and a lot of different types of businesses closing, are there, th are there different tenants that you would stay away from? Anybody that is not what's considered a credit tenant. Now, CVS is a credit tenant. Mm -hmm. um, Wal Walgreens is a credit tenant. Starbucks is a credit tenant. Uh, Dollar General is a credit tenant. Meaning they guarantee the lease through their lease term. So if the company goes... Uh, and if the company closes a store, yes. uh, either to fi fight off uh, bankruptcy or whatever they're trying to fight off, if they close a store, they still are liable for the remainder of the lease. And how can you do a research on who is a credit tenant? Talk to commercial real estate brokers that specialize in single tenant net lease deals. They'll have information for all of that. ICSC is the best resource. Mm-hmm. But but David, on, on they they may be liable, but if they go bankrupt, yeah, but they just get bankruptcy protection. They don't actually go bankrupt. How many companies have you actually seen go bankrupt? But they entered bankruptcy and closed a whole bunch of stores, right? Like Bed Bath and Beyond here is closed. A like Bed Bath and Beyond, right? Yeah. So someone but, still pays that rent for them. They have to. The the it's a corporate guarantee. I see. Now, it could get caught up in a bankruptcy, but those corporate guarantees, depending on the judge you have, will probably uh, get issued funds from, you know, freed up money uh, from restructuring before uh, any other, uh, like C a CEO's bonus won't get paid before the corporate guarantee leases will get paid. I see. Like with them, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Amazon wanted to go into the prescription prescription drug business and put a lot of pharmacies out of business, perhaps. But you have CVS and some of these other concerns that are also turning into like um, urgent care sites. I, so I don't see how they're going to be able to do that because in order to uh, get a uh, painkiller, uh -huh. so a narcotic yeah it takes a written script and you must be in person and sign in person after they check your id and everything else before you can get that script so they may be able to go into the pharmacy world for um antibiotics and stuff like that but uh they will not be able to deal in uh narcotics legal narcotics online right at least not right now and a lot okay. of insurance companies have contracted with the cvs's and the right aids and stuff so on and so forth yeah and so dr richard mioli would definitely have uh input on that okay <laughs> all right thank you very much yes ma'am what's next let's see uh blue cross partnered with cbs interesting uh except for my uh, they also misuse yeah well that's true ben uh, everybody you know how do you guys know how to misuse irr in a pro forma it only takes one thing to manipulate this position cap rate that exit cap rate, manipulate it half a point. You'll change the value of the deal by a million dollars, depending on how big the deal is. 
Number one way to manipulate your IRR was with that exit cap rate. What else you guys have? Wow, still 55 of you here. Thank you guys for hanging out. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, then uh, I will bid you adieu yeah. until tomorrow at 11 a.m. East, where we will talk about due diligence. Right. A real quick, if I may, it's going to be a little bit of a sales pitch, but I'm on the uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, if anybody's there and have any curiosity or questions about the CCIM. I'm on the membership of the local chapter. I'd be happy to take you to lunch on one of our monthly meetings, buy you lunch, and you could just sit in and understand what CCIM, fantastic networking opportunity because it goes a lot more than just commercial brokers. There is a lot of bankers and accountants and everyone else. Thank you for letting me do the pitch, David. But I Michael, any time because I'm 100% with you. But yeah, I, and again, I will put my, quickly, I will put my uh, email address in the chat box. And again, this is for the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'd be happy to buy you lunch. They have great speakers during the lunch. They also allow you to, they present uh, the properties that they have that is available. So you can go there and, and listen. So anyway, rather than taking everybody's time, I'm going to put my um, email in the chat box. And please reach out to me and we can have that conversation. Thank you, David. Yep. And so you guys know, only 67% of CCIM are brokers. The rest are appraisers, lenders, attorneys, CPAs, developers, syndicators. You do not have to be a broker uh, to be, get your CCIM designation. And like I said, it is the MBA of commercial real estate. Best education you can get. Fundamental education. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much. And we will see you uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. East. Enjoy Thanks the again, rest David. of the day. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks David. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tyus.